So I'll begin. Uh, the topic of today's talk is around slavery to sovereignty. The reason I've chosen this topic is because I've come to the conclusion that slavery is not just something that occurs in a digital platform. So a lot of you at this event perhaps would be looking at it in a way that uh, how do we escape the financial system, which would be digital? How do we escape uh, the surveillance state, the state of surveillance or, you know, uh, applications that we use? But slavery expands far beyond the realm of digital. So it is good to focus on the digital. I wanted to expand it and show you how slavery uh, affects each and every single one of us through various uh, categories, whether it's digital, uh, whether it's through the mind, whether it's your body, whether it's your health, and a lot of interactions that you may have day to day um, could be chained up without you even knowing it. So that's why I've chosen this topic. And I would like to show you how, as an individual, I have personally uh, strive to break the chains that have, uh, you know, held onto so many people in life. So without further ado, I would like to begin on that topic. So my name is Amin Rafi. Uh, you can look into my background. My website is mentioned uh, uh, on the slide. And you can uh, look into my other videos and everything else I've done. So my goal from the start was to see how decentralization could impact society. It was very important for me to see how this could be related to various countries and various, uh, let's say, cultures. So for me, it was very interesting to see how blockchain was being uh, applied in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Cyprus, in Australia, and in Mexico, and various other countries that I've uh, kind of lived in along the way. By taking these examples, I was able to see a nice depiction on how a society functions. So for example, in the Netherlands, uh, I really like the communities there and the way that they apply it. In Australia, due to a lot of the population, for example, uh, studying business or finance, I didn't see too many things that excited me. It was mainly being used in logistics or finance. Uh, so for me, the most exciting applications of blockchain were, in fact, in the Netherlands, Germany, and of course, uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and in Mexico, again, due to a lot of corruption and a lot of things that have occurred, uh, you know, it was hard to establish a base with people where you could get them to want to use a digital currency because uh, in the past there have been a lot of corruption and, you know, people's monies have been lost. So they're very attached to cash. So it was interesting to see these things. So that's my background. I've kind of traveled around and uh, done workshops, talks, uh, wherever I could to educate people on these topics. I've also liked to work on myself. So as I said, slavery for me isn't just the digital realm. I like to break the chains in various aspects of my life. So for seven years, during the time that I lived across three continents, over 12 countries, I did live on cryptocurrencies. Um, at first, it was very hard, you know, using local Bitcoins or exchanging it for cash. At other stages, I expanded this to using, you know, uh, Bitcoin debit cards or uh, the Visa cards. This made it much easier for me to interact with society, obviously, uh, because you could just go to an ATM and go about your day uh, by using cash. So it was interesting for me to also see how I could use crypto while living across three different continents. Um, usually it's quite uh, complex to use it in one country, let alone uh, applying it to more than a dozen countries across three different continents. Though again, a lot of tools came up, such as the Bitcoin debit card that really, really helped me. And uh, you know, some of them have gone missing, some of them have shot down, though there are still uh, bits and pieces of these organizations that allow you to use such systems. So while I'm going around, uh, I'm trying to find the truth, uh, trying to find uh, ways to free my mind, free my body, and free myself from the digital realm as well. So these digital tools really help. One of the most important things that I kind of came across to realize is that there's no such thing as anarchy. We live in an inverted world, that the focus is always on the other side, right? There is only tyranny. So when we speak about anarchy, we always say, oh, we're, you know, those who are fighting the system. But why are we fighting the system? The real problem is that we have tyranny, is that we have suppression of ideologies, of people's freedoms. Liberty isn't something that we should have to fight for. Why do we have governments that we have to request that freedom to be given to us rather than 
you know, it being a normal thing. So it's funny to really look at the whole scenario of anarchy and kind of come to the realization that there is no anarchy. There is only those who suppress. And once you understand that, it changes your whole paradigm on how you deal with society and other things among it. So when we look at slavery, it affects uh, our lives in many different forms. As I mentioned, it's beyond digital. It can be your mind, it can be your body, it can be your health. Um, you know, as an individual, you could be uh, needed to rely on medication. As an individual, you may need to attend a job to pay off a debt um, that you have kind of linked yourself to. And in the digital world, we have many tools that people use on a daily basis. So your work may request that you use certain applications that may require you to scan your face, for example, to log in. So there's lots of different aspects in interacting with society that may chain you. So my aim was always to break away from these kind of uh, limitations in life and to introduce some sort of a liberty. But to understand how powerful as an individual I could be, I would first have to see where I am tied and where I am limited and where I am a slave. So I was a slave on many different aspects of my life without even realizing. So one of the things I was a slave to was comfort. You know, as, as a person from originally from Iran, obviously the cold temperature was not something that I uh, was accustomed to. And then living in Australia, which was also a warm climate. So while in the Netherlands, I wanted to break this uh, slavery that I had to temperature and conditioning that uh, was predisposed. And from doing so, I was hoping that my mind could be altered. So then I could figure out what else it is that I am holding on to that should not be there, that may limit me. So it's not so much that the cold bothered me, but removal of that fear allows me to expand in other parts of my life that you may not realize at that time. So I did that. In the Netherlands, I trained myself to be able to withstand extreme cold temperatures, whether it's sitting in a frozen lake or sitting in the snow. And this had huge impacts on other parts of my life because removal of fear is liberty in itself, emancipation from the actual uh, limitation within yourself. I was also a slave to food. You know, we've grown up in a society where we say how breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When you look in nature, this is not the case for the average uh, mammal out there. They do not feed on a daily basis. A lot of times they may go hungry for days, if not weeks. So I wanted to also break this chain from myself that I realized I have lived at that time close to 30 years and uh, have never taken one day off from eating. So I was a slave to consumption. I was a slave to eating, to food, to these urges that resided within me. And to break these chains, I decided to do a fast, uh, a period of fasting, which lasted seven days. This allowed me to break that chain again. And I was emancipated from that need to continuously feed. Again, we get told stories, you know, we, tell, we get told stories that as a vegan, you may get sick, that you may be weak that you may not be able to do certain things, that these things exist within you. I'm not pushing an idea here. I'm merely saying things that exist as stories and narratives. To break these narratives, I decided to, as a vegan, uh, deadlift twice my weight. Again, as I went forward and I broke these chains that existed, I was able to emancipate myself and to learn who I truly am beyond the narratives that were given to me that I did not choose. So we live in an inverted world. What do we mean by inverted? Inversion exists in many different aspects of our life. And uh, if you take a quick look at various industries and various uh, organizations, this seems to be the case. So as a designer, as an engineer, uh, you know, we can remove conspiracy, okay? We can put that to the side. Let's just look at it from an engineering perspective. There are huge design flaws within, you know, numerous and very important uh, industries in our world. So for example, school, which is supposed to liberate the mind and allow the individual uh, to learn and to expand on their curiosity, kills curiosity and encages the mind so that the individual is restricted to a form of curriculum that is handed by the education system. It does not uh, add to curiosity, it limits curiosity. And uh, so that's from school. News, which is supposed to inform people so that they can live a better life, so that they can make better decisions 
actually ends up uh, misinforming people. So they make worse decisions. Uh, it brainwashes people. And these are all issues that we can see across uh, various industries. So medicine, medicine is supposed to heal individuals. So if you look at the ancients, and uh, you know, I, I went to Mexico, and they are huge into natural medicine. And when you compare that to our, for, uh, our current existing uh, modern approach to medicine, I mean, the world is so, it's completely inverted. One heals, one uses nature, one uses pharmaceuticals and chemicals with huge side effects that in most cases, the side effects catch up to, you know, when you're much older. So again, it's inverted. The very thing that you're taking to heal you or help you will cause more damage in the long run. And then you look at food. Most food leaves a person malnourished. They end up sick, ill, or causes a lot of issues. The inversion exists across so many industries. I mean, once you figure this out and you understand it, it's mind-boggling. For me, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Again, social media was introduced to connect people, right? And you, this, you know, this is not my opinion. You can look at a lot of these uh, actual facts online and get the statistics that it's actually caused depression. It's caused uh, so many people to feel even more lonely and disconnected from themselves and other individuals around them. It's destroyed the relationships rather than create them. Sure, it's not black and white, though a huge portion of it has caused that. And these are things that I refer to as inversions, things within our society that were at one stage perhaps doing good, though at this stage and at this time in life, they are causing uh, terrible things. So you can look at it as police, for example. Police is meant to make you feel safe, guarded, secure, uh, though they do not make me at any time feel Got it, secure. Uh, perhaps in different countries, it's, you know, it's, it's approached differently. So in the Netherlands, sure, I enjoyed actually the presence of police because they were never out to rob their own egos. In Australia, it's completely different. Um, in Mexico, it's completely different. So these inversions exist in a lot of different countries, um, though I must actually add that it's not always the case, but they do exist. So before I could actually go out and speak about these things, I wanted to learn what it is that I need to change. So the emancipation of myself, my body, my mind, my health, my digital existence, and then my interaction with the world around me needed to be changed, needed to be altered. So before I could talk, I needed to actually learn and apply it to my own life. So it's not so much the case of, hey, we should be doing this, because talk is cheap. The average person loves to talk about various things, but how much of that are we actually applying to our life, which makes a huge difference? Knowledge without application is useless. You know, I, I hear so many people that say, oh, I read three books a week. You're much better off reading one book continuously for one year until you actually apply the knowledge that you've gathered. There's no, there's no race to gaining knowledge so you can just say, uh, you know, speak at a meeting just so you know you can feel good about something the application is what's important and that's what i really care about so coming back has been very interesting uh, i've spent about seven or eight years uh, previous to returning to australia in april this year uh, across three different continents various countries and you know uh, being in mexico was one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life honestly because it's a place that the average person would fear to go to, right? Again, the inversion, that why it's, it's a place where the cartels run. I can tell you now, after everywhere I've lived and everywhere I've been, I have never lived in a country where I have felt the presence of love, respect, community, brotherhood, and uh, the level of connection that people have with one another to that degree that I have felt in Mexico. It's just, it, it just completely, again, emancipated me and cleaned me of these uh, residues that were you know, left over from various uh, models or narratives uh, that exist in various countries or cultures. So for me, it was interesting to go there and see that. After having returned from a place where more than 50% of the country operates on cash, which is Mexico, and uh, a place where I really, really felt in touch with human beings, um, People were real. I don't know how else to put it to you, but people were truly real and uh, they were there for each other. Sure, it wasn't the prettiest place. Things were falling apart. Systems were outdated. And uh, a lot of things, you know, you would look at and be like, well, we could improve the efficiency here or the systems that are being used. Though 
Take that aside and let's look at the humanity. The humanity that existed there for me personally was on a level that I had never seen across any of the countries that I had visited. The closest that I had come to it uh, was perhaps Eastern Europe and uh, during my travels through Serbia and uh, Macedonia. So it's interesting, this inversion that exists even with our narratives that we believe that we are in a lucky country in comparison. So the average Australian truly believes that they are in a lucky country. So they believe they are in the best place in the world. So after you get out, you know, this may be the narrative with people from the United States too. I don't mean any offense, this is just uh, my observation and from what I've heard and seen from people. But once you travel a bit and once you see how different uh, cultures exist and how different countries provide things that you may not have seen or uh, felt in your own place, you start to reshape that mind, the emancipation of thought and perhaps uh, this has an effect on other areas of your life. So having returned from a place that I truly felt free, Mexico, and, uh, you know, obviously there are issues in the northern part. I was in the southern part, of which is Oaxaca and uh, Chiapas, which is predominantly more indigenous, uh, involves more indigenous population uh, in comparison to the north, which is a lot more affected by the United States uh, culture and other issues that exist. Uh, so having returned from such a place to Australia, I was, I was truly shocked by the number of cameras and surveillance that exists around me. Uh, you know, in Mexico, I could drive for 12 hours. I would maybe see a police, but he was never or she was never on the corner trying to catch me speeding or something like this. They were just going on about their day. Um, liberty exists on a different level. See, they didn't exist there in a level that was you need to be kept guarded, otherwise people are gonna do bad things. It was people just genuinely looked out for each other. So when the more rules you have, the less people look out for each other um, because you rely and depend on the rules. And uh, unfortunately, laws are not natural. Natural laws are very different, you know? And in, when you live in a country that has a huge number of uh, limitations when it comes to freedom due to bureaucracy or other reasons, you get to understand this. So I came back. I came back to a country where the actual citizen feels as though they are free, feels as though they are in the, one of the greatest places they could be. So this is what I refer to as uh, proudly ignorant, or rather it's a phrase from John Pillinger, a great uh, journalist, Australian journalist. So this proud ignorance exists across various uh, countries and it could be from various industries so a lot of the stuff that i said to you for example that you know the slavery model can exist and the inversion can exist uh, in education and in health a lot of people may protect that and uh, not appreciate that comment so we are trying to break away from that so let's move forward so when i returned i noticed a lot of uh, tools that are being implemented uh, due to the COVID situation which for its own reasons, uh, happens to coincide with the introduction of a number of surveillance tools, whether it's drones, whether it's uh, you know police enforcing laws that otherwise would not have been possible. So I started seeing more and more of this, um, especially in Victoria, which is the southern part of southern southeastern part of uh, Australia, uh, where Melbourne is, one of the largest cities, larger cities of Australia. So they have drones that scan people's faces to make sure they're wearing masks. And, uh, you know, I can't help but ponder, were these tools somehow ready to be used or were they just developed particularly for this occasion? If it happens to be the case, it just happens to be a great coincidence. And then I'm seeing more and more introduction of tools that would, you know, otherwise never be allowed to be implemented, such as, you know, as I mentioned, the drones of scanning people's faces at the beaches. Um, cameras hidden within parks to make sure people are respecting social distancing. And then we have the introduction of facial recognition so that the average person can access uh, tools provided by the government, whether it's starting a business, voting, or accessing Medicare, which is the health provider of Australia, and, uh, or accessing uh, welfare, which we refer to as Centrelink benefits. So when you look at this as a whole, um, you may not understand it as a person that lives in Australia, right? Though it's beyond that for me because I have worked as a journalist and I have written many articles and this is a topic that I'm quite passionate about, you know, uh, which is privacy, security, 
uh, decentralization. So I know, for example, in India, uh, the most vulnerable people uh, were targeted when they introduced a system that used biometrics to enlist individuals onto a government-based system. 1.1 out of the 1.3 billion people in the country uh, were enrolled into this new biometrics-based system. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't even realize why they had to do it. They were just scared they may not get their welfare, their you know, social benefits. So in Australia, the similar a similar tactic is being used because a lot of these systems that I said affects those who rely on the government or the state. So sure, you can look at it as like, we should break away from that. So it affects a very uh, vulnerable uh, group of people. So it makes me worry. It makes me worry to see these things because people may not have a point of comparison to see how it has affected other countries. But nevertheless, I am here and I'm witnessing um, a dystopian future being implemented. If you have been to Paralini, please, you would have seen this and uh, you, would have been, you would have heard about uh, how such tools are being introduced and perhaps you would have been educated on how to protect yourself. And we are the lucky ones because we have that ability to do so. You know, as an individual, I know how to protect my system, how to protect my phone, how to protect my digital realm. As I said, I've spent many years protecting other parts of my uh, individual uh, representation, which is my health, my mind, and whatever my, my existence represents, uh, and to break away from that. But the average person doesn't have that knowledge. The average person does not know how to do anything different. And unfortunately, in many ways, our world is decided by the average person. It's not decided by me or you, or people that may have a better understanding on the of the impact that these uh, sort of tools may have on our lives. So another part of it is the, I wanted to show you, is the kind of breaking away from liberties that we have um, on, on the basis of justifying it, uh, for example, in the current situation on COVID, on the, on the war against uh, COVID, the corona. Um, so these wars have existed for a long time. Sure, after 9-11, we saw how many liberties were taken away on the premise that uh, it's, it's for our own good. Uh, the surveillance states that have expanded through the CIA and NSA and you know, globally on many other countries, such as the Five Eyes, um, which includes Australia and New Zealand. We have seen the justifications that it is always for your own good. We're doing this for you. And these narratives, obviously, if you're well informed, um, you understand that it's not based on a very strong uh, prem premise. Uh, it's, it's not the reality. So the average person believes that to be the reality, you know, and that's unfortunately the case. So this is a great book, by the way, by Nassim, um, and I loved reading it. And one of the most powerful things that I took from it is that, you know, be nice to everyone, but if someone exercises power over you, exercise power over them. So sure, you want to enforce these sort of surveillance states? No problem. I'm going to up my operating system, my security devices, everything else around me. So as I said, we are in a good situation, but how do we get other people involved? How do we get other people to break away from the slavery and to see the inversion that exists in our world? So I sat and pondered on how this affects different industries, right? When you look at, for example, from, again, from an engineering perspective, from a design perspective, uh, most systems are built in an upside down model. So upside down, what does that mean? So in 2008, for example, after the global financial crisis, who carried the burden? It was the people, the taxpayers, who continuously carries the burden for the mistakes of those on the top of the model. Again, it's the people. And there's a systematic risk being introduced to the people that doesn't need to be introduced. So again, let's rip away any notion of conspiracy that could be labeled as such. And so let's look at it from an engineering perspective. Why would you have designed a system that would introduce systematic risk and place it on the very people that it's supposed to protect? So the banking system is supposed to alleviate those who are in financial uh, turmoil. So it places the risk on those very individuals. And you can get this same model and apply it across various, uh, across various industries, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. Their risk is carried to the individuals who take the medicine. Uh, you can look at it as the universities, uh, whether the course becomes obsolete or the knowledge is no longer required. Uh, it leaves you to ponder who is left with the 
debt that they may not be able to get a job with or may not have the freedom because they have the debt to explore uh, things that they are curious about. So if you're a lawyer and you have finished, uh, you no longer have the freedom to go and work for an NGO. Uh, you have to pay off your debt. So naturally, you're going to be more driven to go and work for a high paying uh, role. If you're a programmer, if you, you know, various jobs I, I noticed and various industries I noticed shackle people through this systematic uh, uh, system design and the flaw that it has in it. You know, from an engineering perspective, it's absolutely garbage. It's like, it's like designing a car, okay? And if there was a car accident, the passengers take the, take the uh, blow from the accident. I mean, that would be terrible, right? As an engineer, if, if I designed a car that I said, if it gets into an accident, the people inside the car will take the hit, it would be terrible. No one would buy the car. Though a lot of industries around us are designed so that we as individuals take the blow for the mistakes of a very few individuals. So let's look at it from engineering. Can we design things better? Can we emancipate people from a place where they don't have choice? How do we alleviate these uh, particular issues? I love this quote because this quote really gives me hope when I'm, uh, you know, at times scratching my head going, what's going on in the world? What, can we have an impact? Can we do something to make a difference? Of course we can. If you look at, uh, you know, various events throughout history, it's the very minor number of people who have made the difference. Look at Paralini police, for example. How many people come there in comparison to the number of people that have never heard of uh, a lot of the talks and conversations that take place? But yet, these individuals are, are, are the ones that are making the impact and having an impact. I myself have been emancipated in many different ways by just simply attending the Hackers Congress or being to Paralini police and speaking to a few individuals. And then you can, uh, you know, Kind of multiply that across various uh, fields and various things that have occurred on a global scale. So of course we can have an impact, of course we can make a difference and that is the inversion that once again exists in our world where uh, the individual cannot do something. We need to go within the system and get the government to change things or we need to go through the UN and get the UN to change things. Absolute garbage. All of these are absolute garbage. These are narratives that exist on fallacy. Uh, they do not represent reality because in, in, in actual fact, you can't change those systems. You have to create new things. You have to go about your day and ponder how do you solve problems that exist in your world. And to do so, you really need to emancipate the self. So once you feel free, you no longer have that blockage of can I and what else? You, you sit down and go, what, what, how do I apply this? You know? So it brings me back. Uh, the inversion again exists within Bitcoin and its uh, uh, you know, system architecture, uh, which we refer to as a blockchain. A blockchain is what a lot of people focus on, right? So you go to a lot of, let's say, corporate events and it's become more mainstream. It's almost uh, you know, in everyone's uh, kind of mind now that how do we use a blockchain? Well, they refer to it as the blockchain, but we all know that's ridiculous. Uh, how do we use these systems? No one focuses on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first truly decentralized money in human history. Did we forget about that? But yet we see the inversion again. The focus went on blockchain, not this decentralized money that breaks away people's uh, you know, need to rely on the system and on a financial system that is heavily corrupted. And it has an engineering problem that puts the burden on the people. We've seen many examples of this. The control of money dictates if you can go to war. The control of money dictates if you can uh, use violence against someone, you know. And a lot of these things exist. The, the narrative was changed. And we went from Bitcoin being a truly powerful uh, invention, one of the most important in our recent history, that allowed for accessibility, efficiency. Uh, you can see a number of different uh, benefits of Bitcoin. But the narrative was changed and it was altered. So we focus on blockchain. So you'll even hear people will be like, Bitcoin is irrelevant. It's blockchain that's, that we need to focus on. That's the true powerhouse. But that is not the case. And I'm sure many of you attending this event, whether watching online or in person or at any time, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take much time to come to realize that. The sovereignty, the inclusivity, 
the way things are changing. You know, the narrative was changed to focus, to get people to focus on blockchain. And as I said, our rules and our world is dictated by the average, not by the you know minority who may know the truth. And the average person has looked at Bitcoin as this very volatile tool that's used for you know so many negative narratives that has been created around it. Uh, even though we know in reality that it's the financial systems that launder money for, across you know number of uh, wrong doing organizations and. Uh, companies. So the narrative was changed to blockchain and then it was taken public blockchain and we no longer focus on public and now we focus on private blockchains, which is what this new narrative is that the Federal Reserve is going to introduce its own. And we see so many other examples of uh, currencies that are privately uh, managed. And this is not what Bitcoin was about. None of those things that got people excited exist in this private world, though that is the case. Now, you have heard my story. You have heard how uh, I thrive to emancipate myself from the so many limitations that exist so that my mind can imagine a world uh, void of such limitations and slavery that exists within each and every single one of us across various uh, components in our life. So I sat down and thought about the education part. I sat down and thought about why is it that after Seven years, you know, so many countries, so many people, people still have no idea what Bitcoin is. And why did this focus shift away to blockchain-based systems? What happened to Bitcoin? Why didn't people use it? Why is the narrative so negative? So I sat down and figured kind of these things out in my own time. And I wanted to undo the inversion on education. I wanted to give it back to the people the same way Bitcoin took money from the financial systems and governments and gave it back to the people so they may ma manage it. Uh, I wanted to do the same with education so that the curriculum and knowledge is held by the people, not by the industry, not by the money that dictates what people should be studying and what is favorable and what is not. And this brings me to the initiation of Bitopia University, a decentralized university that has not ever existed before. Sure, we have online universities that people think, but a lot of these courses are obsolete. I'm not interested in reinventing the wheel. I'm not interested in hosting courses that already exist in universities that are highly corrupt anyway. I'm interested in the knowledge that the average person cannot gain from uh, whether it's an open university or your typical uh, government or university or otherwise private universities. I'm interested in the knowledge that emancipates the self, like the things that I went and learned about on how to heal yourself, on how to create things within your life, how to empower the individual. I'm interested in this sort of knowledge that you cannot gain. So I sat down and thought about how I can alter uh, education and allow people to come in and use it. So I took the model from Bitcoin. I replaced the Bitcoin miners with students and the validation of those blocks uh, are replaced by oracles. And what if we have a course, instead of having a course that let's say, uh, what's your GPA or what, did you, what mark did you get? What, do you, what about that we have certain criteria that we achieve? So what does it mean to be a black belt, for example, in a course that is about uh, Bitcoin? A black belt perhaps means that you can fork the chain, that you can uh, create your own wallet and compile it that you can uh, program and uh, you can do many different things that you can sit down and think about. And these would be adjustable depending on who's attending and who's doing things. So as I mentioned at the start, um, I, did, I did a few workshops because I wanted to see if this concept uh, is valid and if uh, what I have designed can be uh, constructed and it's required out there. So I held a workshop in the city of San Cristobal uh, in the southern part of Mexico, in Chiapas. And there I asked the people who attended uh, to fill out a questionnaire, which included, uh, why haven't you used Bitcoin? Uh, what is the normal narrative that you hear about it? Uh, how do you feel towards it? How does the technology, in your view, impact society? I asked various questions, right? And I did an analysis on the, the words and the sentencing that people have used. You know, I, I gathered about 20 different booklets and I processed all the words that existed and the limitations as to why they haven't used Bitcoin. Because for me, it was very interesting to find out why they haven't used it. So as you can see, knowledge was the 
main reason that people have not used it. Like many things in life, I'm sure individuals out there want to know how to eat better, what foods that uh, allows them to heal themselves, uh, what, uh, what sort of places they would, uh, for example, learn more from, what cultures they would resonate with. And uh, in this case, I will sure be individuals, if they knew the truth about Bitcoin and the impact that it has, they would be more involved with it. So knowledge seems to be the limitation in our world on how we interact and how free ourselves. And the lack of knowledge and the lack of time for people to gain that knowledge seems to be the issue. Because if you've gone through university and you've accumulated that debt, and you've gone through other things in life that have shackled you in various parts, you're not going to have the... Uh, mentality or the time uh, you can obviously make time right we can all make time but the average person again uh, does not believe they have the time so if we gave them the knowledge to realize they have the time and they have the knowledge to emancipate themselves from the form of slavery in many different parts of their life not that just digital we can start to move forward so i recently did a talk with someone and in this talk i said look we can put bill gates and steve jobs aside what if we have a stand and we give people the knowledge in a digital form. So give me your laptop. Let's sit down and think about why you use Microsoft Windows. If you need it for work, sure. That's just for work. Other areas of your life can be altered, right? Give me your laptop. I'll put Linux on it, and you can go about your day. We don't need to discuss other issues. Uh, same can happen with your mobile phone. Uh, you can jailbreak it. You can do many different things. Put a VPN on someone's computer and show them how to use it, how to pay for it using Bitcoin. And many different things that we can one by one introduce and give people a sort of a key as to how they can free themselves through knowledge. Because knowledge is the most powerful thing. With knowledge, you can do anything. Sure, um, a lot of people like to focus on money. And money, sure, helps in many different areas. But with knowledge, you can gain money too. But with knowledge, you can survive without food. You can survive uh, in extreme conditions. It is the knowledge and the application of that uh, knowledge that makes a difference. So Utopia is a decentralized autonomous university. It exists on Aragon as a decentralized autonomous organization. If you want to contribute, if you want to collaborate, I would love to hear from you. You can find our link at bitopia.org. We have a Telegram channel and various other channels that you can reach out on. And I'm trying to build something revolutionary here. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I want this to be a unification of various uh, decentralized applications and technologies that exist. I have done my proof of concept in the physical. It has worked, people love it. Um, and I see the limitations. For example, so many events and workshops attract the similar minded people. It's an echo chamber that's bouncing back and forward. I want this to be more than just blockchain knowledge. I want this to be permaculture, ecology, and other things that emancipates the individual no matter where they are. I want people to contribute to the curriculum, which will be completely open source for anyone to contribute to. You will be rewarded for it. As a student, you will be rewarded. The top students will be rewarded on the tuition that comes in, um, in a form of basic income. Why should a student have to go through university and uh, accumulate debt? Why shouldn't a good student, just like a powerful miner with a great hash power, be rewarded for the work that they have done, the proof of knowledge, the proof of contribution? So these are the elements that I have implemented, and I don't see anything like this ever being done before. So it is far beyond any online course or online uh, university. It is, a, it is a redesigned and re-engineered model of education and giving access to people anywhere in the world. Uh, I hope to do to the education industry uh, what Bitcoin did to the financial industry and emancipate the minds and bring knowledge out from the hidden corners of the world and have a decentralized library that people can access and uh, lift up things that are otherwise hidden so we don't swim uh, in an inverted world, but rather a world that represents reality, a world that represents true knowledge passed down through generations rather than a few individuals who dictate it based on their financial or uh, political incentives. Thank you very much for listening to my conversation. Uh, again, I would have loved to have been there. It is completely different uh, speaking to a camera in Australia at 9.43 p.m. Uh, than actually being there in presence. I love Paralympic Place and everything it represents, um, and I hope to return there uh, in the years that comes. And uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope you learned something, and I hope you understand as an individual uh, that 
you know, slavery affects many different parts of our life and it's up to you. It is always up to you as the individual to figure out what is limiting you uh, to reach a sovereign state, whether it's digitally through different open source and secure software or, uh, you know, other parts of your life, physically, relationships, health and everything else, so that you may uh, get a better understanding of who you are and how to apply it. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much as well, Amin. Uh, by now, there is not any question in the hop in app, but uh, all those listeners uh, uh, on the internet can still use it. But we have one question here in Institute. So, uh, do we have portable mic? Or no? Please come. Uh, so, Amin can see you. You can stay on the camera if you want. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, Chuck, can you hear me? Okay. Um, at the, towards the beginning, you mentioned something um, kind of interesting. I'm wondering if I understood it right. Um, because it sounds like what you were describing with this sort of creeping totalitarianism in Australia versus Mexico. Uh, was a system where uh, one government bureaucrat decides that, you know, we can use surveillance for this application. And so he or she pushes it through. Uh, and there's not really any organized conspiracy to create this whole outcome. It just sort of evolves. And I'm wondering if it would be accurate in, in your view to describe this mechanism as someone who's sort of trapped in the system, seeing a way to expand their personal power and ability within the framework of the system as a whole uh, by increasing some level of surveillance and control because now they have uh, control over some group of people. They have more data about some group of people, uh, which in turn increases the power and control of the system over everybody, which net reduces the power uh, and ability of any one person in the system, which in turn inspires more people to try to increase their own uh, power by subjugating others, which sort of continues this vicious cycle of the system getting ever, ever more powerful and people trying to carve out their own little fiefdoms uh, or niches um, by measures that end up making the problem worse. Does that make sense okay. to you? Sure. So I guess the the uh, the perspective that you're depicting here would uh, entail that they are merely opportunists, that they have seen this occasion rise, um, they being the government or whoever the uh, organization is a part of the implementation of such surveillance uh, systems and tools. And uh, they have gone for it while a person is on their knees, for example. Is that is Am I understanding it correct? Yeah, and that, that the driver is almost uh, more the powerlessness that the existing system imposes on the people who are part of it. Because if you're a government bureaucrat, you know, what's your biggest uh, goal in life? It's to advance and become a higher ranking government bureaucrat. It's not a particularly fulfilling existence. Uh, but if you can carve out some semblance or some feeling of having achieved something by putting out cameras or drones that cost people for not wearing masks, uh, at least you get the feeling of having escaped the thing that's rep repressing and oppressing you, if only for a few minutes. But that in turn, by repressing and oppressing other people, inspires others to take similar measures uh, to achieve a similar outcome. It's like a vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, like I can entertain that, though I would have to be and I don't mean anything bad by it, I would have to be naive to believe that they are so oblivious to it, that this all just happened by coincidence, that so many tools that that just popped out, you know, I would have to be naive to assume that there wasn't some sort of a design to all of this, some predetermined uh, outcome or path to this, uh, that where did these drones or somebody come? Where did the software mm -hmm. suddenly get implemented on it? Where, where did the, you know, the, uh, the procedures come into it? 
Mm. But it was almost as though it was all waiting to happen. So I can entertain what you're saying in the point that, you know, as an individual, if you were doing that, but I can't, I can't do that um, because I know there's more to the story. Um, well, I, I think one, one way to explain this, I mean, I'm not saying there's no grand conspiracy. Um, I'm just saying we don't really have a lot of evidence uh, for a grand conspiracy uh, because if there is such evidence, it's classified top secret. Um, I think there's a, a big trial in England right now uh, of a certain uh, white-haired publisher uh, who is potentially being sent to his death for exposing parts of what might be a conspiracy. Um, but if you from a theoretical perspective, if we try to explain it without recourse to conspiracy, uh, you could look at cybernetics, uh, which came around in the late 40s and early 50s, as an academic theory, uh, which posited that the solution, more, more or less, that I can summarize, that the solution to any problem uh, that a politician or government official might have is more surveillance and control. And it provides a very concrete, almost mathematical step by which you can solve nearly any problem of government or corporate management by more surveillance and control. In an, in an sure, in an uninspired mind, that may be the case. Yeah. Um, so I can give you two examples. For example, in the Netherlands, that is not the case. If I was to compare the Netherlands um, in, uh, in, in, and compare it to the UK. So in the UK, when you walk around in specific London more than the UK, um, there's signs everywhere that you're being watched, do not steal. And you constantly feel this pressure as though, like, am I doing something wrong? Why am I being watched? Am I a criminal? Like, what's going on? Whereas in the Netherlands, uh, if surveillance is done in a correct way, the individual will never hear about it. I truly never felt I was being watched in the Netherlands at all. And I'm not saying there aren't cameras there. So that narrative that it depicted, that uh, they always feel that they will have uh, better success with more surveillance, I think that is a very uninspired mind. It would be similar to the parent that constantly watches their child in case something happens versus the, the, you know, the parents that allow their kids to have the freedom so that they can learn themselves while being there to help them feel secure at the same time. Um, so I will have to bring that reasoning and justify that too. Well, I think if you look at a lot of the, the people who make these decisions in government and industry, they certainly aren't very inspired people. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, I definitely agree with you there. It's because the individuals don't choose the role to, you know, in most cases, if you look at the police officer, let's say in Australia, I very doubt through my experience feel that those individuals that came, became a police officer became a police officer because they wanted to make society more safe and secure. In a lot of cases, based on my interactions and understanding, they became that because they have a void in themselves that they needed to have some sort of a, a feel that they have power somewhere else. And it is those very individuals that should not become police officers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then we can apply to this to various roles within society where there's a politician that feels uh, validated through their role, even though they do very corrupted things versus the humanitarian um, who may never get to that level of uh, access in comparison to the person who is very self-centered uh, and uh, self-serving. Thank you. No worries. And just to add, um, I don't like the word conspiracy because conspiracy for me is used to uh, to dismantle so many arguments, especially these days. Um, a conspiracy for me is the is is the financial uh, is the Federal Reserve. That's a conspiracy that no one can audit it. That for me is you know again the inversion occurs so much in reality. Once you start paying attention to this inversion across so many parts of life. Uh, it blows your mind, really. Like the Federal Reserve is a conspiracy. The government of the U.S. and the illusion of choice um, and the power grab they have on so many countries is a conspiracy. There's so many things that are in reality conspiracy, but we don't refer to them as conspiracy. And the reality has been referred to as conspiracy. Again, the inversion exists there too. Um, I just wanted to add that to it. Thank you very much, I mean, uh, yeah. Nobody else is demanding uh, the question. Or if you can ask very briefly. Uh, so we, then we have to free for the other session. So just a brief, uh, very brief. I'm a content creator. I actually create content for open source products. What, uh, for Bitopia, what incentives do you have for content creators? Uh, do, you, do you mean in terms of articles or actually content for education? Uh, uh, content for education. 
Uh, so it's it's a decentralized autonomous organization. So if you want, in, you know, if you want to be incentivized for the uh, for the work that you're doing, uh, we have our own uh, token embedded within Aragon, and uh, depending on what you're doing, it gets it's all transparent through the system of uh, I guess the DAO system that Aragon has. So it would really depend on what you're doing. We have that system um, that we use our own token, but the token is also backed uh, by finances. It hasn't kicked in yet. The, the idea is that you know a certain amount of tokens equal a certain amount of dollars and they're inter interchangeable so and the, as, as the tuitions come in um, tokens are purchased and burned depending on what happens so when a student pays for a course those tokens are burnt and they're interchangeable with the DAI which would represent one dollar uh, which is the best way we can do it so you can get it in Bitopia's token um, and in time you'll be able to exchange it for DAI and do whatever else you want with it so that's the incentive model Thank you very much, Amin. No uh, problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, have a nice day. <laughs> Good night, guys. I'm going to bed. <laughs>